Also, we will extend this network beyond the European borders uh, because we have a lot of guests now worldwide that are participating right now and are interested in this topic. And I will uh, choose my own. And thank you, Francisca, for this wonderful introduction. Beant as well, Pernil and Rasmus for handing in the project and choosing us as project partners as well and all the other uh, wonderful project partners um, that we were lucky to meet over the last uh, two years, almost three years, isn't it? Almost three years, yeah. It's a long time, so a lot of data was um, gathered during this time, and um, Bent and I were lucky enough to gather this data to think about how to find some coherent way how to interpret this, what we found in all these fields, because we have a lot of countries involved and they have um, different um, systems. So basically, some of you um, that follow us and came all of this throughout all these uh, conferences, will know a part of these results, but for most of you it's new, which uh, makes me very happy, actually. Um, and we, I will start to introduce the SIATI and the basic idea of what was behind. As Parnila said, they've noticed some phenomena. They've noticed that this disadvantaged group was not addressed by these policy papers. It was not present because Honestly, when you talk about entrepreneurship, you always think of innovation, of highly qualified, and so on. So, um, but also you have a very important uh, part of entrepreneurship that is basically um, represented by disadvantaged groups, like migrants, for instance, also women that have created uh, important social um, social hubs of innovation due to their situation, of course. So the idea was um, basically that within Europe, we noticed that there were a lot of adults that they had not completely upper secondary education. It's 21.6% in 2019. I think the situation has changed a bit uh, due to Corona, of course, and this difficult economic uh, time and also to the Ukraine war, they have 12.5 million, which uh, it sounds really terrible, uh, they have less than low, lower secondary education, and the proportion of adults um, is higher actually among um, adults born outside the country of residence than among the adults born in the country. <coughs> and Retraining and upskilling adults in precarious employment is a high priority for the European Commission until 2030. And this was actually at the core also of this project because we wanted to address this, um, these issues as well. And we also assume that not all the adults want to upskill and want to reskill. So the question is, perhaps is entrepreneurship indeed the solution for social integration. So as Pranil was uh, already presented, we are a beautiful consortium, um, very different, and um, you will see it actually, um, you see it in the data, because this, all the systems, uh, of course, they have an influence how they work with these disadvantaged groups and how they read social inclusion. So we tried to, when we started, actually we thought, what is the theoretical underpinning of this project? So we actually, we thought, we, we've noticed that when we, basically, when we define entrepreneurship, there is not so much space for disadvantaged groups, yeah? And again, education, of course, there is this dimension of social integration. So, but entrepreneurship education as such, um, it needs a further conceptual and theoretical development. 
And it was characterized, and it is characterized actually by three different types, which were very relevant because when we started to collect the policy papers or the policies or the programs and so on, we've noticed that only two of them, they were addressed and one was not basically as a common um, met as the other one. So for, through, and about enter enterprise, this means that for and about, this means that how they learn how, what is entrepreneurship, so this about, and for is how to do it, basically. But this through, um, this is not as um, common because this means that they have to go in an enterprise, they have to learn how to, to be it without being so much theoretical. And also we've noticed that in the literature, the highly educated are mostly addressed by all these programs and so on. So, and of course, because you see a lot of correlation between innovation and higher education. So in this sense, we couldn't find any relevant, not so much relevant literature on these two topics, entrepreneurship and social inclusion. So, of course, you have all this idea that it influences entrepreneurial behavior, um, financial incentive, uh, of course, it's an important motivator, but it's not a good predictor of entrepreneurial behavior and also mindset, as uh, Francisca was also uh, talking about this uh, topic as well, or this dimension. The cognition is often influenced by factors other than education, like social context and cultural values, for instance. And also, we will see it later in the model that there are many factors that influence one's decision to become an entrepreneur. Also, I will give a, a bit, um, of course, when we started to gather all this project to see in every country what kind of projects, programs um, are addressing this target group. A lot of time, of course, we notice that actually these policy papers are basically social, educational, or labor market policies. And of course, coming to this welfare and system types and the influence on entrepreneurial mind was also a part of this. And we have also the governance perspective. Actually, it's not only coordination between different action actors, but also is the way how everything would function, how the labor market influences the mindset and so on. So all these structures are also very important when we, when we uh, analyze the policy papers. And the agency theory, of course, we were talking about entrepreneurial mindset. And also, this is a, a deep interrelationship between society and also their own situation and how <coughs> they read this in terms of being entrepreneurial. So these uh, were the four main objectives. And we are here. This means that we did a lot of steps. We tested a lot. We and. We've, and now we are like basically step three and four, which are like mostly the same, uh, not the same, but in the same, um, in the same, uh, I don't say, they have the same dimension. We will compare and we will see also the differences between the policy papers that were written after each conference. And we've tried to make a very coherent or make coherent recommendation on the European level for that. Um, this means that, as I said, we will try it and we will give our best indeed to have um, some good and meaningful um, results so that in a way this field comes also in the, into attention of the audience. So we uh, gathered <coughs> over 25 programs and across all these countries, five countries, uh, almost 30 programs, policy papers, uh, 
um, also courses that address this uh, this uh, uh, target group. We made a template and took a look how um, the teacher, for instance, are interacting, what kind of means they are using, um, what kind of courses they are teaching, how um, is the success rate after finishing these courses, and so on. And then, based on this, um, we developed actually a lot of data, but this was one of the models that we developed and we've noticed some common features across these European countries. And we've noticed that there is a triangle actually in the global, actually the global context is very important because the global uh, movement of masses also influences um, the discourses on this topic as well. Um, the, regional, uh, the regional sectors have, plays also a very important uh, part in this and also the institution and the type of funding they are like having. So basically in the multi-level governance we've noticed that labor markets, so social policies are important, the types of funding are important, the types of regimes are important and here we are like talking about welfare system um, because this have a deeper impact on entrepreneurial mindset and um, if um, indeed um, this is a, it is um, one solution to social inclusion or not. And also we've noticed the social, cultural, political dimension. This means that not only the state of the lab labor supply and demand are very important access to the labor market because when you don't have an access to the labor market, basically a lot of time being an entre entrepreneur is the only solution how to enter the labor market or to how to be, to search for a, in a way to search for a social context within the new context. Um, and of course, the institutional, in, in the individual and structural levels are also very important um, on how they can move around this. And individual factors, um, so I don't know if everyone has an entrepreneurial mindset, but as I said, all these factors, they have an important, uh, uh, they, have, uh, they are very important when uh, people think um, of entrepreneur entrepreneurship as an alternative. And here, of course, you have the networks and families, you have the um, resilience and other psychological and uh, mental mechanisms, you have education and training, you have the skills and their recognition and so on. So all of these are quite important when we created, when we've um, analyzed all the data that we have, and like this, we uh, develop this model. So let's see further that uh, what it means that. No, I think. So we moved further on, and we've noticed also that there are differences, not only common um, frameworks, but also. <coughs> Uh, differences like for instance the Scandinavian countries uh, we mean here Norway and Denmark as um, Pernille already presented they have similar approaches to entrepreneurship education I am calling up entrepreneurship education but of course sometimes we are like we mean social entrepreneurship entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship education so basically it's more generic uh, calling it entrepreneurship education because they basically they are dealing with the target group, social inclusion, and also entrepreneurial mind. What do they have in common? Um, they are highly regulated. They have a high involvement of the state and the public sector. Mm, the labor relation, of course, if you take a look, um, there is a centralized coordination, and they have a continuous funding. We could see in the last conference in Norway they were deeply involved in every presentation we had. They would also say, um, okay, this, uh, the National Agency of Employment is behind us. 
they are supporting us. We are having fun, so we don't have any problems uh, concerning that. We have just to develop our idea and um, and actually make a product or whatever they uh, feel like. So this kind of good situation, idea situation, it they make policy ra rather effective. And we developed here a spider net, as we could see, and you've noticed that all this, these are of course a part of, but we thought these are like the most relevant uh, dimension uh, when comparing these countries. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see the colors as good, but uh, you have here Denmark and Norway, they are almost the same. Now I see it in Denmark, no, Italy it has the, almost the same color, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I've not, I haven't noticed that. <laughs> I will change it. <laughs> but what you see it here inside, this is Italy. And this one, uh, they are like basically Norway and Denmark. And you, you can see a lot of similarities. Basically, there is an overlap. Okay, <laughs> I have to move on. <laughs> we can talk forever actually <laughs> because <laughs> we worked on this the last uh, three years and it's it's really very nice to to just analyze how these countries are like um, how the impact of these countries and the system their system on the life forces of uh, disadvantaged groups so um perhaps only one for two ideas and then I will be finished. Um, as Pernilla said, this is actually the reality how it looks like. And you see slightly the Ireland, they have a high participation in entrepreneurship. And of course it makes sense because Ireland, I think it will be here exactly. Um, the GPD per capita, it correlates with necessity motivated entrepreneurship. This means that in the case of Ireland, um, they have a higher level of necessity driven because they have low level of social security and unemployment benefits. This means that if you don't have um, a framework that supports you, continues or at least for a one year or a, a two years, three years, or and everything is very mm -hmm. unsecure, of course you will do everything that you will get in a way uh, a living. Yeah, you make a living and you get access to the money. So in this way, of course, it makes sense what here happened. And Norway, Denmark are very low, but the same in the case of Germany. And here is very interesting, this, this is the number of migrants within the system of 6.9 and 5 percent this um this means that the one they start they are like really want to start a, a a startup a business and actually this is more the reality what happens after one year because as you know within the very first year a lot of companies um fail unfortunately or over 50 percent so we developed also checklists for practitioners because we've noticed, as Pernille said, we've noticed that people teaching entrepreneurship education, they do not have the skills. They do not learn how to teach them. And the basic, or they are not uh, themselves entrepreneurs. So the question is, how should I teach something that I do not know about? Mm -hmm. So this is quite dif difficult. So that is why we thought that this checklist is quite interesting to to, in a way to have some ideas how to deal with this topic and also the policy briefs you have here some similarities as well but I won't read this because it's a lot of text and we don't have time and what is quite relevant as we said um, having all this data having the experience how to to read this in a way we um, the last thing that we want we want to create and net this means that it should be sustainable the project 
at least five years we have this domain this means that we will feed this with new data new information and everyone um, could join this or should or it would be great <laughs> if you would and um, it was very funny actually I had a talk in at the Glasgow University and in the morning, uh, walking uh, on the way to university, there was a banner, there was a construction site, and on the banner was really hugely written, um, sustainability, we mean it. So this means that people are using this, this sustainability concept a lot of time, that in, in a way it's a bit of inflationary, I would say. But we really mean it because <laughs> In spite of the challenges, we really want that after the f we finish this project, that at least in spite of the challenges, as I said, <laughs> I listed here, we really want to have a community that exchanges on, on internet on these topics and post <coughs> their own great projects and programs. And thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's my end of the